Good afternoon, everyone. I hope you can hear me. My name is Julie Bond, and I'm Head of Collections Care at the National Library of Scotland. I head up a team of conservators, technicians, and preservation assistants that help to care for the library's national collection of books, archives, and manuscripts. I joined the library last year, and one of the great jobs that I have is to help to facilitate the Elizabeth Souter bookbinding competition. Thank you for joining me today for a tour through an unashamedly biased collection of highlights from the library's previously annual bookbinding competition. You are very welcome and I hope that you enjoy this short talk where we all have the chance to take some time out to enjoy some very beautiful objects. First of all, I thought it might be useful to share with you all some of the history of the bookbinding competition. Elizabeth Souter was born in Fife in 1924, the only daughter of Magnus and Janet Souter, in whose memory the competition is sponsored. Educated in Glasgow, she spent the war years overseas in the Auxiliary Territorial Service, which is the women's branch of the British Army, before following a varied and rewarding secretarial career in the UK and Canada. Her father introduced her to the Cairngorms and she became an ardent hill walker in, on the Scottish hills and in the Canadian Rockies. She also had a lifelong interest in books, especially travel and exploration. She subsequently married Ronald W. Clark, the journalist, mountaineer and biographer. After his death in 1987, she returned from London to Elgin where she took up her mountaineering interests again. Her first contact with the National Library was in the autumn of 1987, when she contacted the then keeper of printed books, Dr. Anne Matheson, about presenting her late husband's mountaineering collection to the library. That was the beginning of a friendship with the library, which lasted for the rest of her life. Mrs. Clark was keen to support the library and the idea of enabling a craft bookbinding competition was developed. Mrs. Clark took up this idea enthusiastically and from 1993, she generously sponsored the annual Elizabeth Souter bookbinding competition in memory of her father and mother, Magnus and Janet Souter. During her lifetime, she played a very active part in the competition. She always had a very keen interest and was involved very closely at all stages, including the judging and the presentation of prizes. Following her death in 2008, her bequest to the library under the terms of the Elizabeth Souter Charitable Trust has enabled the continuance of the competition for which she held such a deep affection. The first competition took place in 1993 and was open to anyone resident in the United Kingdom. Entries were to have a Scottish theme. The prizes consisted of Best Competition Entrant and Best Junior Entrant under 21. In the first example of my blatant and unashamed bias, I have not chosen to highlight the winning entry, but an entry by my colleague David Kerr. I've been told on many occasions by numerous people that David is one of the best bookbinders in the UK. I think this beautiful example testifies to that. This is a full leather fawn binding with onlaid design of a lady and rose on the front and back boards. The inside boards are inlaid with dark brown and fawn leather with a flower design onlaid. The flyleaves are copies of a Charles Rennie Macintosh design. The book has handworked end bands in white, brown and pink and was presented in a dark brown leather box with gold tooling to complement the binding. The second competition was held in 1994 and was still restricted to the UK, but changes were made to move from junior to student entrant. There were two prizes for best competition entrant and best student entrant, with student being defined as any person receiving full-time training or education in bookbinding. In 1995, it was agreed to open the competition to anyone resident in any of the member states of the European Union. And from 1995 through to 2009, 
the competition entries and prizes remained the same. In 2010, we introduced the best creative category. This meant two additional prizes were on offer, best creative binding, best creative binding student entry, best creative, best craft binding, and best craft binding student entry. The introduction of best creative was to allow the judges different every year to home in on the design aspects of the work carried out when binding a book. It was felt this aspect was as important as the best craft and should be rewarded in the same manner. This example of the best creative binding winner from 2015 exemplifies this perfectly. Pieces for Peace by Anna Linson comprises a binding with visible cords and covers in Oasis, Karung and Eelskin leather. The book has a blind tooled title and end papers in copper foil. The content of the book inside the binding consists of international poetry written during the First World War. The bookbinder's design is based on the cross, the symbol of the indescribable suffering of mankind in every war. We have recently introduced some further changes to the Elizabeth Sutter bookbinding competition. The key one is that the competition will now be held every two years rather than annually. This means that our entrants will have longer to perfect their entries and the prizes on offer are more valuable. What follows is a quick scamper through my own personal highlights of competition entries over the years. Now, full disclosure, I am not a bookbinder and would certainly not consider myself qualified to make decisions about the technical aspects of the designs. But there have been some unique and beautiful entries to the competition over the years and this selection represents some of my personal favourites. This entry, entitled Peter Pan by Isabel Segura Butri, won the Best Creative Binding Overall Category in 2013. This is a full leather binding, sewn on guards, on blue and brown cowhide, inlaid with olive wood and blue agate. The book has leather hinges and end bands. The lettering is in bronze film and it has leather paste downs and marbled paper flyleaves. This binding uses colour beautifully and the layout of the lettering is a very subtle reference to the content of the book. I think the use of the semi-precious stone, which looks like a seascape, is very effective and the tonal balance of the piece is excellent. An object as beautiful as this cannot fail to bring joy. This entry is entitled Understanding Popular Culture and was entered by Penny Stanford in 2002. A review of the book Understanding Popular Culture by John Fisk stated that the author takes a new approach to studying such cultural artefacts as jeans, shopping malls, tabloid newspapers and TV game shows, which remains relevant in the 21st century. Fisk differentiates between mass culture, the cultural products put out by an industrialised capitalist society and popular culture, the ways in which people use, abuse and subvert these products to create their own meanings and messages. This is a denim covered case binding with coloured edges, leather headbands and a pencil in the pocket. This is a simple and hugely effective reflection of the content through the use of iconic denim material this binding is self-assured and reflective of popular culture. In contrast, here we have The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner by Mark Ramsden, which was the winner of the overall category in 1998. This binding houses the poem by Samuel Taylor Coleridge, dating from 1834. The first stanza of the poem runs, it is an ancient mariner, and he stoppeth one of three. By thy long grey beard and glittering eye, now wherefore stoppest thou me? The binding consists of inlaid Nigerian goatskin with some hand-coloured inlays. The glittering eye is set with a sapphire. It includes goatskin onlays, hand-sewn headbands, and handmade paper end papers 
with ends decoration using dye. I think this wild vision perfectly translates the energy and force of the first stanza of the poem. Here we have an entry by Harry Noors from 2006. The book inside this binding is by van der Velde, who was a Dutch author. I believe it translates to a mud flat in time, but this could just be Google Translate having a bit of fun with me. This entry is described by the competition entrant as a Jean de Gonet binding. It is constructed from alumina boards with onlay and copper attached by black leather tapes to the spine in parchment. This entry is described, oh sorry, I've done that. Jean de Gonet, who began his business in Paris in 1975, became one of the best known and most controversial modern French binders through his use of striking designs and materials. This binding can be described as a Jean de Gonet binding in reference to the exposed cutouts on the spine, which reveal the structure of the stitching. This approach, combined with unusual bookbinding materials such as complementary metals, makes for a very striking and memorable competition entry. This entry is by Pilar Calahora and it won the best creative prize in the overall category in 2012. The novel housed in this binding is by Anna Maria Matuti and it was published in 2009. In the book, the main character, Adriana, is a young daydreamer who lives in the strict grey world of her parents, who no longer show any affection to each other. They live in a big house in Madrid where Adriana searches for hiding spots so she can spy on the adults, who are the giants in her eyes. Adriana's gaze is marked by innocence, astonishment and the threat posed by the giant's world, a world where everything is ruled by an order and logic that simply escape her. The novel is set in the run-up to the Spanish Civil War. This entry is a Japanese binding sewn onto extensions. The leather has been worked with mixed technique. The box forms part of the object and harmonises beautifully with it. I just love the colours and the detailing of this design. Our Spanish winner in 2012 has chosen an important modern Spanish novel and brought that to our attention in a very striking way. Here we have an entry entitled Breakfast at Tiffany's by Paul S. Smith and it was entered into the competition in 2014. This design was described by the binder thus. Tiffany glass boards with goatskin spine and cultured pearl end bands. Detachable wooden legs can make this a genuine coffee table book. Stained glass has been used in this design as a cross reference to Tiffany lamps. Tiffany glass refers to the many and varied types of glass developed and produced from 1878 to 1933 at the Tiffany studi Studios in New York by Louis Comfort Tiffany and a team of other designers. This design is also a visual pun on the concept of a coffee table book. A coffee table book is an oversized, usually hard covered book whose purpose is for display on a table intended for use in an area in which one entertains guests and from which it can serve to inspire conversation or pass the time. Subject matter is predominantly non-fiction and pictorial. Pages consist mainly of photographs and illustrations accompanied by captions and small blocks of text as opposed to long prose. Since they are aimed at anyone who might pick up the book for a light read, the analysis inside is often more basic and with less jargon than other books on the subject. Because of this, the term coffee table book can be used pejoratively to indicate a superficial approach to the subject. In this instance, I think the binder is just having a bit of fun and referencing the fact that a binding as striking and beautiful as this should be enjoyed as an object in its own right. Here we have another entry entitled Breakfast at Tiffany's, this time by Luke Hornis, and it was entered the following year in 2015. This is another very different interpretation for Breakfast at Tiffany's, Truman Capote's 1958 novella. 
Here we see Collie Golightly in her cage. The prominence of cat through positioning and use of colour perhaps highlights one of the main differences between the book and the film. In the book, Holly never finds Cat again after abandoning her in the rain. Cat is found, as is Holly, and they all live happily ever after. This design is comprised of Chinese ink on vellum and black goatskin. The end papers were hand dyed by the binder and the four edge drawing was also by the binder. I love the graphic nature of this entry and the restrained but effective use of colour. This entry is entitled Les Dois by Mario Mass and was an entry in the competition in 2001. According to the designer of this piece, this binding was inspired by Coptic binding and in order to facilitate opening, the joints between the boards and the spine are hinged. The boards are made of polycarbonate and the spine is made of PVC. The design is airbrushed on using enamel paints. The Coptic stitch is a decorative stitch so it's something you would only do for a book with an open spine. There's no point in going to the trouble of sewing this stitch if you're just going to cover it up. It has the appearance of a chain stitch once it's finished. One of the primary advantages of the Coptic binding, besides its decorative qualities, is that it allows your book to lay flat when open. This binding demonstrates changing fashions using modern materials to reinterpret an ancient binding style. Hinged bindings were a popular type of entry to the competition throughout the early 2000s. I love the combination of the old and the new in this piece. This entry is by Tune Van Camp and was entered in 2011. This is a single hinged binding of a book by Edgar Clays about his innovative method of binding. The design of this book binding, according to the designer, is a reaction to the many contemporary bindings where earthy tones and soft pastel colours dominate. What a reaction this is. This binding contains two distinct and bold colours and lots and lots and lots of gold leaf, including the edge gilding. I think this is a confident, in-your-face, unapologetic binding which is tactile and stylish and it really brings the bling to the party. Here we have an entry entitled The Hobbit, entered by Steve Alston in 2004. This binding has been produced using distressed red leather with a hand painted and moulded vellum eye. It has worn gilt edges and batik decorated end papers. I love this binding as it is quirky and unusual. I think this eye has the ability to follow you around the room. When I think of it, I think of, when I see it, I think of Smaug, the dragon, given Tolkien's description of his creation in The Hobbit. And I quote, there he lay, a vast red golden dragon, fast asleep. A thrumming came from his jaws and nostrils and wisps of smoke, but his fires were low in slumber. Beneath him, under all his limbs and his huge coiled tail, and about him, on all sides, stretching away across the unseen floors, lay countless piles of precious things, gold wrought and unwrought, gems and jewels, and silver red stained in the ruddy light. This binding takes you straight into the story and effectively evokes the danger and the excitement of the novel. This entry is entitled The Spring and was an entry in 2007. This is a full leather binding with natural leather marbling, including a relief and block cut design. It houses a blank text book. This piece reminds me of a painting by Gustav Klimt through its use of colour and tone. The colours are perfectly chosen for the theme and the marbled leather is reminiscent of an impressionist landscape. The block cut head reminds me of Paul Gauguin's treatment of heads and faces. Overall, I find this a very pleasing artistic mashup. Now we're having some fun. 
This is entitled The Monster Book of Monsters, entered by Alan Whitehouse in 2007. This book made an appearance in the film Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban, which was released in 2004. Clearly, it first appeared in the novel of the same name by J.K. Rowling, published in 1999, but was a more of a feature was made of it in the film. In my research for this talk, I took a deep dive into the world of Harry Potter fandom and came across this description of the book. The Monster Book of Monsters by Eduardus Lima is a particularly vicious sentient textbook that is used in care of magical creatures, while Rubius Hagrid, who thought the book's aggressive nature was amusing, was the professor for that subject at Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry. The book is quite informative, but one usually finds it difficult to access the information within due to the book's unfortunate tendency to try and bite off the reader's fingers. The only way to subdue the book is to stroke its spine, upon which the book opens placidly. I love the playfulness of this entry, and let's be honest, any reference to Harry Potter can't be bad, especially if you ask my 12-year-old daughter. This entry is entitled Self-Reflection and is by Inika Scholte and was an entry in 2007. I love the anatomically correct rectangular pupils in the eyes of this octopus. Now technically, octopus pupils are round in darkness, but they will constrict to rectangular slits in bright light. The fact that the eyes are both very small books with blank pages is a fascinating idea. The eyes are often considered to be the windows to the soul, but in this instance, there's nothing there. Is this the suggestion that an octopus has no soul? Or am I just reading a little bit too much into this? I find this surreal entry for a bookbinding competition very intriguing. Now we have no information from the designer as to what their motivation was. So I feel this gives me free reign to interpret it in my own way. Now there is either a deep hidden meaning to this piece connected to the way an octopus might perceive themselves and how this then relates to the human condition or else the designer just likes octopus and wanted to have some fun. The design also incorporates shells and seaweed, which connect with the overall theme. And in general, this is a memorable and very unusual book binding. This entry is entitled Weep, Ah, Weep Loves Losing and was entered by Chris Hicks in 2005. This binding houses a pre-Islamic poem of love and disaster from the 6th century. It was translated by Wilfred Scowen Blunt and his wife Lady Anne in 1903. This entry consists of a pink Moroccan, Morocco binding with an onlaid russet and brown design with gold tooled dots. I just love the style and elegance of this piece. I admire the choice of the designer to create a very modern looking cover for an ancient poem. This entry is entitled Memento Mori by Sarah Burnett Moore and it was entered in 2018. This binding was entered into the competition when the theme set was Muriel Sparks novels, connecting to the libraries, the international style of Muriel Spark exhibition, which ran from December 2017 to May 2018. As the designer describes, an audiobook of the Spark classic is bound in a black skull with a decaying rose. The designer instructed the judges to remove the rose from the box and display it between the teeth. The skull top comes off to reveal the CDs. I can only imagine that the competition judges had a very interesting debate on the day about this particular entry. Memento Mori is a novel by Scottish author Muriel Spark and it was published in 1959. The title translates to Remember You Must Die, which is the message delivered by a series of insidious phone calls made to the elderly Dame Letty Colston and her acquaintances. Who is making the calls and why? The recipients reflect on their past lives while they try to identify the culprit. So my question is, can this truly be considered a book binding? The skull box houses the audio CDs, 
So in essence, it's performing the same function as a book binding. But is that enough? Does it display the skill and the craft that the other entries do? It's an intriguing question and a useful one for us to ponder. Where does bookbinding go next? If books are to become increasingly digital, then is there still a place for the traditional craft of bookbinding? Perhaps Memento Mori in this instance is more than just the title of a book. This entry is entitled Not to Disturb by Eduardo Jimenez and it won the best overall craft prize in 2018. I couldn't end on a sad note, so I will finish by highlighting this stunning binding. This entry won the best overall craft prize in the same year as Memento Mori, the previous slide, was entered. Continuing the theme of Muriel Spark, the binding houses Not to Disturb, which was first published in 1971. Here is a summary of the novel. A storm rages round the towers of the big house near Geneva. Behind the locked doors of the library, the Baron, the Baroness and their handsome young secretary are not to be disturbed. In the attic, the Baron's lunatic brother howls and hurls plates at his keeper. But in the staff quarters, all is under control. Under the personal supervision of Lister, the Baron's incomparable butler, the servants make their own highly lucrative preparations for the tragedy. The night is long, but morning will bring a crime of passion of outstanding attraction and endless possibilities. This piece is bound in black calfskin with suede inlays. There are small pieces of dyed wood onlaid on both boards. The binding includes black and white leather headbands and nubuck and peccary leather fly leaves. The titles are in white on the spine. I think this is a visually striking design, which has been produced to the highest possible standard. The detailing and execution are perfection, and it is a sheer joy to behold. The bold black and white design evokes a black and white marbled floor in the entrance hall of the house in Geneva, and takes me right into the setting of the novel. When entries of this quality are still being created, then I have faith that the future of bookbinding is looking good. There is a growing interest in the craft and the younger generation of bookbinders bring enthusiasm, style, wit and intelligence to the craft. I look forward to being able to share my favourites from the competition over the next 27 years too. Thank you very much.